for our panel for joining us today on the first day of our great alumni weekend um, with students and alums attending um, events both virtually and in person um, pretty much from all across the globe so thank you all for being here from whatever time zone you're joining us from it might be a good morning or good evening but we're happy that everyone's here uh, my name is megan janisiewicz and i'm one of the opportunities managers within the career center um, our alum offering their time so generously in this way is not only a great way to hear about their individual journeys since leaving the university, but also a great way for those of you that want to follow in their footsteps, perhaps, um, to ask some of those questions that have been on your mind. Um, they all have very interesting and very varied journeys, so we're excited that they're here to share with you. Um, we are really lucky to have such a really fantastic and engaged alumni community, and so we really appreciate everybody joining us today, both, both those of you that are on camera and off camera. So this session was done in partnership with our development team. And since this is a weekend for um, alums and students, and I fall into neither of those categories, um, I am delighted to have our current student, Catherine Molner, who will be representing our students and leading the discussion today. So just a little bit about Catherine. Catherine is currently completing her MA Honors Joint Degree in Comparative Literature and English. Um, Catherine has been the School of English president um, since July of 2021 and has just actually been re-elected for another academic year this coming fall. As president, Catherine has taken initiative to improve accessibility, EDI policy, and career support within the School of English this academic year with highlights including her management in English Careers Week, School of English Book Drive, and English and Theater of Diversion, Theater Lime and Salt event, which I went to and it was absolutely fabulous. Catherine is also the Social Media and Operations Coordinator for Enterprise Education in the Center for um, Educational Enhancement and Development and works towards improving career readiness and entrepreneurship accessibility to students at the University of St. Andrews. So pretty, pretty great um, track record there. Um, I will be making myself useful covering the, um, the chat box and the text box, so I encourage you if you have questions throughout um, the presentation to put them in there. Some of them we might be able to have um, as we're going through the questions, some of them we might save till the end. It just kind of depends on how, how the flow goes and how things go, but do put your um, questions in there so that we can get those answered. Um, if we don't get to every question or you want to ask questions offline, we will have contact information for all of our panelists that we'll give to everyone at the end so that you be able to reach out and make connections because um, that's a big purpose of what we're doing today. All right, so we will go ahead and start with introductions. We'll kick off by having our panelists take a few minutes to introduce themselves and then Catherine will take over and get into the questions. So we will start and um, we'll go down the line for um, Gemma, Allison, Peter and Jillian to give us their intros. Hi everyone, thanks so much for the invite. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, so yeah, my name is Gemma, as you can see from the, the slide, I, I think the slide's still up. Um, I graduated in 2013 with my degree in maths from St Andrews, um, but I am now, uh, not but, and I am now um, a freelance science and technology writer, and I'm also a PhD researcher, um, currently based at University College London, um, doing a PhD in science and technology studies which for anyone who hasn't come across it is kind of sociology politics economics anthropology of science and tech um which is really fun um yeah in terms of kind of what i'm all about and kind of giving a bit of context ahead of the discussion today so um i'm i'm a freelancer and i think even thinking back to the jobs I've had that weren't freelance, I think I've always had a bit of a sort of freelance um, attitude towards work. I've always just followed what I found interesting and tried lots of different things. Um, so when I was at St Andrews, I interned every summer. Uh, one summer I went to the US and worked as a sous chef at a camp because I had um, experience as uh, being a chef um, here in Scotland. Um, one summer I went and did door-to-door -door knocking for a charity down in London, which was an experience. <laughs> if you ever want to work out what um, Britain thinks, go door-to-door -door knocking, you get quite an array of people. And I also interned at JP Morgan in um, equity capital markets in their investment banking division. So quite a lot of different things. Realised at the end of all of that that I didn't want to do any of those things um, as much as I'd learned a lot from it and ended up in advertising. So I literally Googled Creative Business Jobs London and ended up in an advertising agency called Ogilvy and Mather um, and basically was doing a lot of um, it, what's called account management, so essentially managing projects and so on and so forth. Did that for about a year, realised that wasn't for me either, uh, wanted to kind of get back into science and tech after doing my maths degree and being really interested in that. 
and I ended up being uh, put into the innovation team within Ogilvy and Mather. So my job was basically to go meet startups, meet interesting researchers and try and forge connections. Spent a lot of time at conferences and traveling. It was a really cool job. And it was really where I kind of felt like I got to dive into learning about things at the cutting edge and asking questions about those that are quote unquote building the future, whether it's through science, technology or combination or other. Um, at about a year into doing that, or just after a year, uh, Ogilvy did a really innovative thing and they shut the innovation team. So I was made redundant when I was just in my early 20s, which was um, a really interesting experience, which if, if anyone's interested, we can touch a little bit about that, um, being made redundant <laughs> nowadays. Um, but in hindsight, it was the best thing that could possibly happen to me because it forced me to become freelance. Um, I needed a job to pay my London rent immediately and I didn't get a huge payout. So it was very much just get whatever work I could um, and one of the things I tried was writing and uh, putting my ideas out into the world, sometimes speaking them at conferences, sometimes writing articles, doing a bit of consulting, all sorts of things. Um, and I literally just Googled how to become a freelance writer. <laughs> and, uh, and over time, just built up lots of different experience, lots of different bylines. Um, ended up writing a book called Smoke and Mirrors, which is all about the role of hype and narratives in science and tech. That came out two years ago. Um, and as I say, been doing lots of different forms of writing everywhere from The Guardian and The Times and Wired through to doing more corporate um, writing as well, which we can touch on. Um, and as I say, finally, now doing now doing my PhD, which kind of ties a lot of the themes together. Um, I also host a lot of podcasts, which for anyone who's in the writing world probably knows that that's or the journalism world knows that that's a big area, too. Um, I'll stop there. Hopefully that's useful for a nice uh, get us ready for our discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Gemma. I think I'm up next. My name is Allison Angel, and I'm just really honored and humbled and really excited about this conversation and to meet these other panelists whose careers are so varied and different from mine. Um, I got a master's of letters in creative writing and poetry from St. Andrews in 2009. Um, previously, I have a degree in literature and a certification in education to be a teacher from the States. And um, what I'm doing now has sort of always sort of maybe like Gemma sort of unfolded and has been kind of a surprise. I've kind of followed things I'm interested in. But after I finished my degree from St. Andrews, I taught for a little bit and then I um, was planning to be a high school teacher, but there were hiring freezes at the time across the states. And I ended up getting a job at Scholastic because I had a writing degree, actually. Um, my first job was sort of a business writing job, um, which was quite a shift from um, creative writing and what I had practiced at St. Andrews. Um, uh, my first couple years at Scholastic were in a corporate partnerships group, um, and we built partnerships with tech companies, um, government companies, content partnerships, um, and Scholastic, um, for those not familiar, I should have started by saying this, has all different arms. Um, it's known as a children's book publisher and it is the largest children's book publisher in the world, as I'm sure you're familiar. Um, but we also have an education arm, which is really kind of what I was more aligned with um, the first part of my time there. And now I am in a different part of our business, which is called book fairs. And book fairs is actually Scholastic's biggest business unit. And we distribute these experiential sort of pop-up bookstores in schools across America, tens of thousands of them a year. And my current role um, really has to do with strategy and um, sort of two things. It's sort of bifurcated, but long-term business strategy. We can kind of get into how writing sort of led into some of this maybe in the conversation. But um, And the second part of my job is related to equity of access, which is just something I'm very passionate myself. So part of my job has to do with leading a team of people to um, make sure that kids across America can have access to books who might not otherwise have had access to them. This is kind of a new thing that I'm leading. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy to be here. I am not from the publishing side of Scholastic. And so a lot of the writing that, you know, I know this is about the written word that I've done um, is in all different things from marketing to sort of just like corporate presentations and financial presentations. So we can kind of talk about that. Um, yeah, very happy to be here. Of course, these opinions are mine, not Scholastics. And I hope that our, all of our experiences are useful to those people that are listening. 
Fantastic. Thanks very much, Alison. Um, and uh, thank you very much um, to the Career Service for the invitation to come along and speak today. Um, I'm Peter Ranscombe. I'm originally from Nairn, near Inverness, up in the Highlands of Scotland, and I currently live in Edinburgh. Um, I studied physics at St Andrews between 2000 and 2004, which makes me feel really old compared to the other people on this panel today, uh, but I'll try and get over that. Um, after studying physics at St Andrews, I went on to train as a a journalist at the Scottish Centre for Journalism Studies through in Glasgow, which at the time was run by Glasgow Caledonian and Strathclyde Universities. And from there, I started doing work experience and shift work with the Scotsman newspaper. I'd already done some work experience uh, within the media both um, at school and then during my time at St Andrews and a big shout out to Claire and Gail from the press office who helped me to set up those original work experience placements if they're watching. Um, and so having done work experience, having done shift work for the Scotsman, they then offered me a job when I finished my journalism training. And I stayed at the Scotsman for nine years. Um, originally, I was working on the professional pages and the special projects in the newspaper. So writing everything from science and medicine through to education and learning, media, government, and then some of our special projects, which at the time included the 2007 and nationhood debates when we were marking the 300th anniversary of the Union of the Parliaments and um, more, more unusual projects like um, Scottish Wildlife Week and the Seven Wonders of Scotland. After those first three years at the Scotsman, I then moved over to the business desk and I was using my science writing at the more applied end. So writing about things like life science companies, technology companies, but also a, a broader spread of businesses as well. So this was the time when the craft brewing revolution was kicking off in the UK. So I was writing a lot about beer brewers, um, about whiskey distillers, about wine merchants, and that's gone on to influence some of the, the work I do now. Um, so after nine years with the Scotsman, I took voluntary redundancy back in 2014 and began working for myself as a freelance writer. So now um, about half my week is spent doing journalism, so writing for newspapers, for magazines, for websites, the traditional kind of articles you would expect, things like um, news stories, longer interviews and features, um, and like Gemma nowadays, things like podcasts as well. The other half of my week is copywriting, um, which Gemma touched on a, a little bit with her, her corporate work earlier on. And copywriting is writing for things like companies, for uh, public sector organisations, for charities. And originally copywriting was very much about marketing and about advertising. So think about Mad Men, things like that. Nowadays, what's a lot more popular is content marketing. So writing content that perhaps is a social media post or a blog post, but also stuff that will go into the traditional media as well. So a lot of my time is spent ghostwriting, comment and opinion and analysis pieces for companies or for charities, um, or writing things like advertising features where companies have paid to take a, a couple of pages in a magazine and then hire a journalist to present present what they want to say in a, an easy to understand and informative way. Um, and as the conversation goes on, we'll maybe um, pick apart some of the similarities between copywriting and journalism. And um, the final part of my writing is, is by far the most fun part, um, is fiction. Um, so I grew up wanting to, to be a writer. I, I grew up writing short stories and then making covers for them out of cardboard um, serial packets. Um, so the fiction writing is, is definitely the most fun part of what I do. Uh, my debut novel was published in 2014. Um, it's an historical thriller called Hair. It takes the story of Burke and Hare, Scotland's most notorious murderers, and asks what happened next to Hare after Burke was hanged, because in real life nobody knows. It's one of these wonderful gaps in history, and that's exactly what um, fiction writers, and particularly historical fiction writers, want, is when they can start to weave a, a tale, sort of base it on history, and um, but then let their imagination run wild. Hi everyone, really glad to be here. Um, my name is Gillian Gamble. I graduated in 2011 
I'm originally from Dundee, so not far from St Andrews, and these days I live down just outside of Durham. Um, I had a bit of a different experience of university because I actually um, didn't go straight to university after school. I spent some time um, traveling and because of a youth project I've been involved in, I got the chance to do a bit of travel writing and writing for a documentary. Um, and one of the projects that just happened right before I started at St Andrews was um, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami that happened um, on Boxing Day. Um, and I had recorded all of these like um, individual stories on mini disc and whatever for a project for BBC. Um, they had a project called Blast at the time, which was a youth project. Um, and just before university, I had had all of that material stolen in the street because I was mugged in France on the way back home from that trip. Um, so coming into first year of university, I was just coming in after all of that. Um, and wondering, you know, I'd really like to, I, I kind of felt I would really like to redo that project in some way. Um, and in the first um, winter break in the January of first year of university, um, I'd made a connection in Southeast India and took a trip there to record a similar project, uh, again, about the follow up of the Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, and uh, I had no idea that that project was about to become the thing that dominated my university career, but uh, throughout my time at St Andrews that became a big deal, so um, we had connected with a family that were looking after 30 odd children and um, needed a building to be built, so the experience of writing that I had at university was um, very much persuasive writing, so asking people to get behind this project. Um, and it's when I started to do um, illustration as well, because I, I started to illustrate what we were trying to achieve, like taking photographs, but illustrating the future building we'd like to create on top of photographs and that kind of thing. All just all just ways of communicating, basically. Um, but yes, that project really took over and it resulted in um, setting up a charity and subsequently a social enterprise called Tea People. Um, selling um, Darjeeling teas and uh, it was and through that I also of course I was constantly writing like pieces for the press and all that kind of stuff. Um, so my my studies at the time were in English but I was finding it hard to juggle all of those things um, and approached the university for some help um, and Bonnie Hacking who is still in St Andrews now heading up I think the Entrepreneurship Centre um, was very, very useful. Um, so we found a way to, to balance everything. And it's only recently that these different threads have come together for me. So I was trying to juggle studying, you know, poetry, uh, Scottish poetry mainly, with the modules that I chose for studies, along with running this charity. Um, and it was very, very busy and a bit overwhelming. But one of the things that came out of that is I just started to spend time um, drawing for fun. So it's just something that I started doing and I, you know, I, on a daily basis, I would just draw something and put it in a little Facebook album. Um, and that's something I've been doing now ever since. So 12 years or something like that. Um, and over time that's turned into a career. So uh, these, uh, I was spotted online by smaller publishers to begin with. And then I got a break with Penguin Random House in the US to do a few books for them. Um, and these days I'm working for uh, Walker Books and Puffin and HarperCollins in the US, doing a mixture of illustration and writing. Uh, I've just signed with a literary agent in the US called Andrea Brown Lit, which is the oldest children's agency in the US. So um, I'm working on some of my own writing too, things like graphic novel, um, all of which is uh, speculative work, of course, because you have to produce something and then try to sell it to publishers. So it is... There's a big time commitment at the start. Um, but because of that social enterprise connection, I spend other time writing persuasively again. So working with social enterprises, helping them pick out what is the narrative of what they're doing, trying to get to the heart of what they're doing, to get it into the public sphere a little bit more, um, writing press releases again, all that type of stuff. Um, so I usually do that on a contractual basis. And yeah, and I'm helping... Uh, fashion designer who really cares about soil to write a popular science book about those things, about why people should care about soil. Um, so I find myself in that role again of just translating 
um, interesting stuff about making it um, sort of like easy, easier reading for a general public. So that's what my career is going to be. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for the great introductions. Um, so as you can see, we've chosen a pretty varied group. They have such interesting, diverse and varied experiences. Um, so hopefully that will spark some questions. So Catherine is going to take over now and lead us into the questions that we have prepared. But just a reminder, feel free to pop your questions um, in the chat and we'll have those towards the end. Take it away, Catherine. Yeah, thank you so much. And it was so amazing to hear how varied your paths have been as well into the careers you're in now. Um, the first question we have mainly has to deal with your time at St. Andrews and how you see that impacted your career path, especially I would say as students, sometimes it's easy to be lost in how much activity is really happening here. Um, so I, I would say we're very curious in the way in which your time in this, you know, quite small town really impacted uh, where you've ended up. Um, if we'd like, I'd love to start um, with Allison, especially since I did participate in those book fairs as a child, the scholastic ones at my elementary, uh, my elementary school in the States as well, um, maybe quite nostalgic. Yeah, so um, I would say I've, I've talked to, to St. Andrew's students for the last couple of years and I really enjoyed it. And the more I thought about this question, because they asked the same question, um, I realize most of um, where I am now or what I'm doing now, it was sort of unintentional. So I'm not sure that necessarily you can can plan, you know, what you can get out of it now. It's sort of in hindsight that I see these things, basically. But my first five years of working at Scholastic um, were writing a lot of copy myself before I sort of was managing people. I would say now um, I've been there for over 10 years. A lot of my job is managing people and strategies, but my first five years were, were managing copy. Um, the copy that I was writing was um, was persuasive. It was it was business pitches to sort of win a, a you know kind of like what Gemma was doing probably with Ogilvy, um, win a partnership with another company. And um, I spent a lot of years. Um, you know, actually all of the, the folks on this call here have worked with businesses, but kind of trying to understand what the motivations for those businesses would be and then to write something really concisely and clearly that would um, get their attention and sort of mutually be beneficial to both of us. And when I uh, think about what I learned in poetry, there's actually really tangible things that I used for PowerPoint and Google Slides presentations that I would have never thought um, would have been transferable and and that I wouldn't also that I don't mean it transactionally like I got this and I used it for this but it, it turns out that um, writing well concisely clearly tactilely um, understanding how sounds mimic um, or sounds can well mimic what they're either trying to enact a lot of those poetry specific things um, if you can write that way in a business setting it turns out um, can also be really really efficacious. I have found business has its own sort of nomenclature, its own vocabulary, and it can tend to be very abstract. And um, so, yeah, so I would say on the poetry side in particular, um, being able, and I have to kind of ground myself that in that still sometimes, because I still write presentations myself um, and my team. And then what I was going to say is I sort of got into managing people who were writing pitches and presentations and giving presentations. And so all of those kind of, um, yeah, that tactility, I think it sort of is what tr is what still transfers, um, you know, and separately, like, this is not related to my career, but of course, I still write poetry um, for, for many reasons for myself, not for my career. And so I just wanted to say that it's not like poetry turned into, oh, I took these things from poetry, and they ended up in a career setting. But um, that's something that I took from St. Andrews. And I also think, um, workshopping the 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 actual style of being open, you know, being open and bringing something creative that you've written and having it be open to other people's thoughts on it um, is very vulnerable. And I think that also uh, w is sort of a skill on um, being open to that. I don't know that I've I've um, attained anything, but I think in the business setting that I work in, I still find that type of um, 
being open to um, your ideas or your strategies or your innovation or your words or your language or how you're trying to describe something um, to others' thoughts. And also, um, you know, it's like a very, that type of collaboration is, is also very valuable in a business setting. Yeah, I imagine you need quite a thick skin, especially a lot of you have had experience in copywriting and definitely uh, you have to be open that it's about the business side of it as well, rather than your own personal writing too, since writing itself can be quite empathetic and personal process. Um, no, that's really quite fascinating. I think definitely nothing gives me the fear more than having to share personal work at a seminar. Um, so it's good to know there's some, there's some uh, money out of that as well. Um, maybe we should go to Peter next. I'm curious to hear about you know, how your work, especially in the field of STEM, lended itself quite a lot to fiction. Uh, yeah, I mean, possibly more on the journalism side of things to start with. Um, so having studied science at university, that kind of set me apart in a newspaper newsroom. So you can become a journalist um, through many different routes. There's no one set path. It's not like being a, an accountant or a lawyer or something where you sit professional exams and then you qualify. Journalism is, is much closer to being a trade. You need a set of skills and need to know how to apply those skills skills. So um, although in the past a lot of journalists would have gone straight from school to work for maybe their local newspaper and then built their career that way, a lot will now um, study journalism um, as a postgraduate diploma or as a, a Master of Letters degree. And most of them will have been arts or social science graduates. And so as a science graduate going into a newsroom, I brought something different to the party. I brought a different set of skills. I perhaps brought a different language almost. Um, I could talk to scientists, even if I didn't know their specific field of study, I could ask them the right questions and then turn that into a story. Um, the the other way in which my time at St Andrews and studying science influenced the journalism was through being numerate. Um, even being able to work out a percentage in a newsroom will set you apart from um, from other journalists. Um, journalists are often scared of maths, are often scared of numbers, so even just being able to do simple things is a, a valuable skill and um, news editors or if you're a freelancer commissioning editor would recognise that as a worthwhile skill and if they've got a story that's perhaps seen as being a little bit harder or a little bit drier um, because it's based around statistics or it's based around numbers, they know they can go to a science graduate. Um, I think more broadly when it comes to doing interviews as well, I, I definitely noticed that um, people in the life sciences and technology communities take me more seriously and think I'm more credible because I studied at St Andrews because I have a, a science degree from, from Scotland's first university. Um, when it comes to the fiction side of things, that's, that's a really good question. That's um, a, a great um, point. So um, studying science helps when it comes to research, I think. Um, and, and it's it, no, no different from arts or social sciences in that sense. When you do a, a literature review, when you go back and look through journals and see what other people have written about a topic you develop really good research skills and when it comes to doing historical fiction that's absolutely key um, now that doesn't mean that every single fact that you've researched is going to end up on the page of the novel um, particularly with hair because it was a historical thriller I didn't want to write a police procedural from the 1800s um, it needed to have some pace it needed to have some excitement um, but it also needed to be at least grounded in fact and start with historical fact and then work from there um, so yeah so so definitely the research skills I used for that um, started out in St Andrews yeah, especially being here at such an established university, oftentimes you feel quite a lot of pressure, I think, um, to live up to that name. I mean, even being a student here, sometimes you walk around and realize you're on grounds that are, 30, you know, centuries old, really. Um, but then you are held up to quite high standard and then hopefully then obviously do quite well as you've done yourself. Um, I think we'll go next to Gemma. I'd love to hear um, kind of about your time at St Andrews and the way in which that's impacted where you've been up now. Been up now, my goodness. Sure. Um, I mean, just to kind of, um, I don't. I sometimes have a lot of regrets about my time at St Andrews. If I'm honest, I feel like I didn't use it well enough. Um, I felt, you know, I was. I went straight to uni from high school, and you know, very much enjoyed the student life as a young person who's just discovered alcohol shall we say and didn't 
school to <laughs> as many lectures as I wish I'd gone to and I didn't make the most of the library god when I think about having access to a library now it's just like my god I wish it you know wish I'd made the more, most of it so in terms of the actual degree yeah I got through a master's degree I did well all that jazz and, and that's great um, but to be honest I think what I really took from if you think about my time at St Andrews it was actually a lot more to do with my work so I, as I mentioned, I interned every summer. I was really keen to, to work as much as possible. I worked all the way through my time at St Andrews. I worked up at the Fairmont, um, but I also had other kind of part-time jobs working in, as like a brand manager. So I helped like, um, you know, advertise things to students for small companies. Um, you know, I was kind of, I, I, you know, I worked when I was at high school and then I, I came to St Andrews and I, I, I needed to work. If I didn't work, I felt lost. So um, what I'm trying to say here is that because of all that, I'm I'm very used to kind of just jumping between lots of different things and getting involved. And I think when it comes to being a freelance writer or being a writer nowadays, if you're not sort of full time employed by a publication or working as a copywriter full time for a brand, you have to spend a lot of time, as everyone's mentioned, juggling a lot of different projects and jumping into different things and having a real big sense of self motivation um particularly if you're doing things like writing books because as Gillian mentioned you have to write it before you can even sell it I mean with non-fiction it's not so bad you only have to write a chapter and you can sell on proposal but with fiction you have to write the whole damn book so I guess what I'm trying to say is like I think for me when I think about my time as a student it wasn't so much what I was learning, but rather the type of life that I was living and, and even socialising and finding my own path. You know, when you're a writer, it's a lot about self-reflection, a lot about thinking about, um, I don't know, yourself and your reaction to things. So, um, yeah, I would say that's probably most what I took from my time St Andrews is, is brought to what I'm doing now. Yeah, thank you so much for that. It definitely um, has reminded me to attend my lectures next year as well. <laughs> uh, let's go to Gillian. Yeah, that, that was an advert for not going to lectures. I do regret, believe me. <laughs> I always think of it, my dad goes, you're putting money down the toilet, get to your lecture. And then immediately, I'm like, that's quite capitalistic. Me, it's not that wasn't an issue for me, but maybe if I had, had to pay, and maybe that would have been in it. <laughs> it would have helped motivate. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's go to Gillian then for this question about your time at St Andrews. I definitely appreciate the, the environmental side of things. I think is sometimes more important, oftentimes, to our experiences than you know being in the lectures themselves. Although, don't don't let the professors know that in this chat. <laughs> Um, I think it impacted me in a couple of ways. One is, um, I mean, I was never really destined to be like an academic because I just I like to just move more quickly or something in life, so I, I never have the patience. Um, but studying poetry, I think, has had a massive influence on all of my work, actually, because it is the most concise form to me of expression. And from my point of view, a picture book is not just for children. It's actually just a form of poetry in word and image. Um, so that's come in very useful because um, from what I've seen so far, there are a lot of different um, categories of picture book out there. Um, and I definitely lean more towards the sort of like weird and interesting um, type, maybe rather than um, the kind of mainstream, I don't know, sort of lighthearted style. And so there were definitely things that I studied at university that helped me to feel like um, that's an okay way to be <laughs> um, and to, to sort of like push the boundaries uh, within the picture book format. Um, I just remember reading some interesting and dark things in Old Scots with um, Robert Crawford and Barbara Murray and just really, I mean, yeah, I just felt like I was in the best book club ever actually a lot of the time and maybe appreciated it a wee bit more just because uh, I'd attended slightly older as well and um, so it didn't feel so much like work I guess. <laughs> um, so it's impacted me in that way. Um, and just those experiences outside of the classroom that I mentioned of having a lot of support and having 
so I, I never thought of myself as um, remotely a business-minded um, person at all until I was at university. But they ran a thing called they ran a thing that was sort of called like business for English students or something, or it was sort of like an introduction to creative enterprise or, or getting literary students to think about um, whether business was for them because really business just has a lot of as you say its own language and its own jargon that's not rocket science but it can be a bit off-putting or feel a bit maybe a bit soulless I suppose if you're like a poetically soul like some of us are um but I really you know I the stuff that I learned on the side through the career center about actually the benefits of understanding um the structure of business how businesses work and then being able to apply that in a different way so um, getting involved in lots of um, social enterprise, creative enterprise and that type of stuff. Um, and I even, we opened a temporary, like a storytelling cafe in St Andrews for a couple of years, which was quite entertaining. Um, so that's when I got to see like, you know, how can I, yeah, that is kind of how all the threads start coming together for me around um, things like poetry and enterprise and community and, um, and then it made me really interested in things like when you get like, because um, Scotland has the Macar, so it's like a poet who speaks for the people, um, folk musicians who, you know, write what's on everyone's lines and sing about it. Um, I've become really interested in how all those things tie together and how they influence um, thinking in communities. And obviously we study that a lot in a historical context when we're studying poetry, it's usually something older, but we do study the modern Scots poets as well. Um, but just, yeah, really interested now in how that type of language influences um, politics, people's thinking, well, like, uh, starting with books that children read, because they are actually very philosophical and political a lot of the time. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I definitely agree about the aspects in which uh, oftentimes, just as in, uh, in STEM schools, it's not pushed to go into perhaps more of creative writing field, the same side being in English, um, you're not really presented with perhaps a variety of job opportunities that are actually quite out there. Um, what I'm really curious about as well is hearing about you guys um, taking your direct experience in Andrews and going on such a, a different path. I think what students really would love to know as well is something you wish you kind of known when you started on your career path, especially coming out of your your time in St Andrews. Um, oftentimes we're told there's the cruise centre, there's SEED and a lot of students don't take advantage of that because we don't know where to go or oh we think that's not for us. Um, specifically I think we're talking about social enterprising especially it's not something a lot of students in arts think about as well. So I think we might have lost Catherine there. Yep, I think we have a, a bit of a freeze. Oh, wait, I, think she's back. I think she's back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, Christ, my goodness. Sorry, I guess my laptop is still taking revenge. Um, what, what part of my question did it cut off that? <laughs> so I can go back. I, th I think we got the gist you were asking about what we wish we'd known before we... Yeah, what's the one piece of advice you wish, if you could go back in time, what's the one piece of advice you wish you could give yourself when you started out on your career path? Um, we can go in reverse kind of and maybe start with Gemma and work our way up. Um, so at the point that you actually started your career, um, I mean, I don't know, probably would probably would be to say that you don't have to do something based on like what your degree was or what you think your experience is. Because I think, you know, as much as I, I'd gone and worked in the bank to begin with, um, that was because I was like, well, they like maths grads, so I guess I'll go try that out. And then when I didn't like it, I was like, well, I also, I actually never wrote until I was a lot, I did a lot of art, but I didn't write. So that was why I wanted to go and work in advertising, because I was like, well, that's a creative Career. It's funny actually, Alison, you're mentioning earlier doing copywriting. I never did copywriting until I'd finished at Ogilvy um, because I was in account management. So, um, so I don't know. And I think a lot of that held me back. You know, I felt that I was, I should only do what I already had experience in and, and whatnot. And I think you can sometimes, when you're a grad, feel that, you know, oh, I've done this degree and I have to kind of find something that's definitely relevant or, or whatever. 
you know, and yes, it's absolutely amazing to be able to use your skills and, and especially if you have a keen interest. But you also have to remember that you're so early in your career, you've got so much time to learn and you can, starting again is not starting again when you're in your early 20s. Um, you know, like I've started again so many times, I'm 30 now and I still know I'm very young and I could start again, again, and it would be totally fine. So that would probably be my my main thing is just, you know, let your brain expand beyond the box of I studied English or I have experience in this job or so on and so forth. Really allow yourself to explore. It's really lovely to hear, especially I think uh, oftentimes you get to university and think like this is it. This is who I am. But um, definitely there are so many choices now and it's really lovely to know that you don't need to just plant yourself into something it's good to take some time and find yourself in that um we can go to Alison next if you uh have any careers advice that you like to give yourself when you started out I'm I you know I think so much happens for a reason I, you know I was going to say something very similar to, to Gemma actually I you don't I don't think that you always know what you're interested in and and I think that um to sort of plant yourself so deeply in something um, from a career perspective very early, um, you know, can just be a little bit like, um, I don't know, stifling or something. I, my, I, I maybe had a little bit of a naive thought that I wouldn't like working in a corporate culture, um, based on really nothing. I just thought it wasn't creative. I, I think, I don't really remember it's so long ago now, but I, I think that, um, folks who follow their interests, you know, I can't remember the exact phrase, but, you know, in general, um, forcing yourself into something that you kind of think you should be doing, I don't think that very, there, that very much works well. And I, I've found kind of in a corporate culture that just following what you're interested in and just kind of exploring new things, try marketing and then try, you know, editorial, if you can get into it or um, just try different things and see how you like them. Because I don't think that you know until you are actually in it, even sometimes in my experience for years um, of doing that actual work um, and just be willing to to change. And and also, I, I really mean this kind of more of, a, of an encouragement, I, I think, to current students um, to not put so much pressure on like, we're, gra we're graduating with an English degree and we have to be doing something with, with writing. Um, you know, start doing something and practice it and become an expert at it. And then you'll know if it, if it feels right. And if it doesn't find something, you know, you'll see something that is interesting and keep, keep kind of following that. Um, that's, that's my experience anyway. Yeah, that's very lovely as well. It's been nice some inspirational quotes to put up <laughs> around town. Uh, Jillian, if you have uh, any advice you'd love to give yourself when you start out on your career's journey. Um, I think I'd follow on from what Alison's saying actually as well about trusting your instincts about what you're interested in, even if it feels quite niche. <laughs> um, I think one mistake I made was trying to please everyone with what I did early on and ending up doing projects that should have felt fulfilling because they were like with a big name or a big paycheck or something but they were just kind of like not very fulfilling at all and it's just because I was in the wrong like just part of the publishing world I was just doing stuff that someone else might love but it wasn't really my thing um, and of course it's what's important as much as especially freelance in particular what you say no to is very important as much as what you say yes to because your time is so limited and in publishing as well it's often booked up two or three years in advance at least at the stage I'm at now so I learned over time to have that confidence to say no because I'm leaving a gap for something that's a better fit um, and sometimes that is it does feel quite um, risky turning down things that seem like oh because I, I used to think like, well, that's really well paid. I'll just, I'll take that and just get it done and it'll be fine. But it never, ever played out like that. It was always like, I took longer to do it because I wasn't into it or things like that. Um, and and on the opposite side, nowadays, <laughs> to give a quick example, I, I suppose I've learned what it feels like on the inside when you do follow your instincts. So I know when I'm doing it and when I'm not doing it. Um, 
and I just start because I can maintain that thing of just drawing whatever I want and putting it online with a few words here and there. Um, I've ended up with jobs now that are like in, insanely closely aligned to these like niche things that I've been drawing for fun, like um, a flying whale has become really central to one of my jobs, and it's like um, it's really weird because even the publisher's like, oh, this text is so similar to what you've been drawing, it seems like it's meant to be, or uh, all that type of stuff. So I think you do get that confidence over time of knowing who you are. Um, I think the advice I would have given though is just to take more risks sooner on that, to take the risk of saying no, um, to take the risk of just trying to pitch things as well. I held off far too long to um, go look for an agent and I waited till an agent approached me and of course I could have maybe moved forward a few years earlier um, in children's publishing if I'd just like got out there and called like emailed some agents with my stuff. So yeah, I think you just have to get really comfortable in that space of like jumping off a lot of ledges and seeing where you land and just being okay with it going either direction because you know it's just part and parcel of um, this type of life. Yeah, that's definitely great advice. I think especially I just try to live by what Abba said and that's take a chance. So I mean they were right, and especially with the careers you you've all had, especially. Um, I think that goes to show as well. Um, I think, yeah, we're ending with Peter here on this question about uh, what advice you would have given to yourself when you started out looking for a career. Yeah, I think the one thing I wish I'd known when I was starting out was about how journalism or how the media is structured differently um, to other sectors. So a lot of my friends who went to work for banks or went to work for the public sector, they kind of had a very set career progression. They knew they would maybe move into one job, be promoted into another job. There'd be um, increments and salary bans and that kind of thing, and it would all be very structured. And it's very much not like that in the media, um, and particularly when it comes to newspapers. And as newspapers and magazines shrink, as their staff become smaller, you can end up doing two or three people's jobs and your wages won't go up, your salary won't go any higher. And that's that's really tricky because it has a knock on effect for the rest of your life when it comes to buying a house or starting a family or whatever it might be. So I think I wish I'd had more of an appreciation about how it's difficult to to plan your career in the media compared to, to other fields. Um, we'll maybe talk a little bit later on about some of the absolute joys of doing journalism, though, and some of the, um, the advantages and the amazing things you get to do. But I think that sort of cautionary tale would have been a good thing for me to hear earlier on. Um, in terms of a top tip, though, um, I kind of followed my own top tips. This this is a wee bit weird, um, but it's, it's come out a bit in what um, Gemma said as well. It's about work experience and internships and gaining experience of writing um, because as I touched on earlier on um, journalism isn't a profession it's more like a trade so um, editors the people who are going to hire you they're interested can you write can you spot what a story is and can you find the right people to interview and the only way you're going to get practice at that is doing it whether it's going and doing a week's work experience or a fortnight's work experience during holiday time or whether it's writing for the saint or writing for a specialist title or even editing a church magazine or something like that until you can build up that proof you know those bylines demonstrating to editors that you can write um it doesn't really matter what your degree is it doesn't really matter if you've been on a training course it's the quality of your writing that's going to get you a job oh there we go i'm glad you followed your own advice especially then seems to have worked out um i'm just going to check in with megan here if you'd like to actually go to um natalie submitted a question i was thinking we could take a minute and um go to her questions since I think they were really interesting. And then we can go back and ask uh, some more questions, of course, if we have some more time. If that sounds good. Yes, yeah, um, we, we let people, if they wanted to submit a question to kind of do that for us. Um, and a really good one that, that piqued some interest from some of our panelists was about the pros and cons of self-publishing versus traditional publishing. Um, so if you guys could speak on that, that would be great. 
I'm happy to jump in first if that's if that's helpful. Yeah. So um, I'm so I'm traditionally published. Um, I'm I published with um one of the imprints um of Little Brown, um which is part of Ashet. <laughs> but if you've ever uh, followed any of um the book publishing industry, you'll see that it's like companies within companies within companies, and and God knows what else. It's sometimes hard to work out. But um yeah, I'm published by Robinson, which is owned by Little Brown, which is owned by Ashet, and um I guess the pros of traditional publishing things that I really benefited from and was one of the reasons that I went for it is I wanted um frankly the credibility I wanted to know that my book would make it into actual stores um it you know I with self-publishing it can be a much longer route to being able to get in front of people in a physical way um doesn't mean you don't, can't get right uh, readers you can sometimes get way more readers in self-publishing but I for my own maybe it's ego I don't know but I think when you when you write a book you want to see it in bookshops um and traditional publishing is is arguably the best way to do that and um, when you're first starting out um however it's much more difficult to get into traditional publishing and I wouldn't some I wouldn't say that the the benefits necessarily outweigh um the drawbacks like you know if you're if you're debut and you go into traditional publishing unless you're really famous or you happen to have written a pitch that they think is going to be the next big thing and they put tons of marketing behind you you're very likely to kind of disappear into the many 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 authors that a big company or traditional publishing company have um which is partly what happened to me I didn't have a huge marketing budget behind my book so I had to basically do absolutely everything myself literally everything like writing the press release emailing the journalist emailing book festivals and saying hi can I speak emailing podcasts being like hi can you interview me please and it's not a very fun thing to do especially if you like writing you're probably you might not like promoting yourself and I found that quite difficult but also extremely time consuming and a little bit thankless so despite the fact that I had this big massive company behind me you know Little Brown Publishing Malcolm Gladwell and all these crazy massive authors um at the same time I felt sometimes very very alone um I also didn't get huge editing um the help that I thought I would get um I you know submitted my final draft of my book I was half expecting a million edits and all they said was I think you should make chapter three chapter one and that was literally it I then got a line edit where they you know check the spelling and all those sorts of things um but there was no editorial um kind of help and I was really excited about getting that when you're a journalist you're used to an editor kind of ripping apart your work and it feels horrible but it always makes it better and I didn't get that with this big fancy expensive publisher so you know it's it's pros and cons though my book made it into bookstores it got published um I get to say that I was with Little Brown which helps with my credibility if I want to do other books and so on and so forth um but there was a lot more work on for getting my book out into the world that I personally had to do that I didn't realize beforehand and I kind of wish I had um but yeah so that that would be that was my experience anyway I think it's a very similar story when it comes to fiction writing as well. Um, so back in the day, self-publishing was known as vanity publishing and had a very dirty reputation. And the internet has really changed that. People can write a story, turn it into a PDF and sell it on Amazon for people to download on their Kindle. And you can do that from one day to the next. Um, and people have had great success with that sort of E.L. James and Fifty Shades of Grey is kind of the classic example. Um, and the guy's name has gone straight out my head, but there's a, a crime writer from uh, the north of Fife, a farmer, who did a very similar thing, sort of self-published online and got a traditional book publishing contract after that. But I think for everybody, for every E.L. James, there are maybe a thousand 100,000, a million people whose books go out onto Amazon and maybe three people download them. So a bit of it depends on your motivation. You know, why are you writing fiction? Do you want lots of people to read it or are you doing it for self-satisfaction? Um, fr from my point of view, I again sort of went through the slush pile. I was picked up by a, a traditional publisher and it's a similar kind of story, um, but not only from a big publisher point of view, but from a small publisher point of view. Um, I was published by a very sort of niche specialist historical fiction publisher and 
that meant there wasn't the same marketing kind of support as some of my peers who who went with larger um, publishers. And so again, I was doing a lot of the work myself to to promote the book. Um, one maybe to wave the flag a bit for traditional publishing, it, it not only helps with credibility, it also helps to get you in front of people as well. So there are a lot of book festivals who will only work with people who have been published by a traditional publisher. They won't look at you if you self-published your novel. And similarly, with a lot of writing prizes, with a lot of competitions, they're, they're not happy to, a lot of mainstream ones aren't happy to accept um, submissions from self-published authors that they prefer to stick to traditional publishers. There are some online awards that are only for um, self-published books. Um, maybe if I was 10 years younger, I'd be looking at self-publishing now. But when I was pitching my book, when I was um, trying to find a, a buyer for her, it was very much traditional publishers that I was interested in. Sorry, I missed out one big thing as well. Then. Mm. Peter, you didn't say either, which is the, the money side, which you don't, a lot of people don't get into writing for money, but um, there's a massive difference between self-publishing and traditional publishing in terms of how you're paid. So just very quickly, if you're self-publishing, you normally get the money for, <laughs> for whatever you sell your book and you get all of it minus perhaps, you know, an Amazon fee or something like that. Um, so maybe you get like 90% of the proceeds. So if your book is, you know, £10 or something like that, you'll get much more of it than if you're traditional published. Peter, you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on that. But if you're traditional published like I am, so my book will sell for 13 99 is the RRP. 85% uh, of that goes to my um, publisher and another 5% of that goes to my agent. So I only make like 10%, sometimes less than that, 8.5% of every sale. So in short, you make absolutely no, no money in traditional publishing unless you sell lots and lots and lots of copies or unless you get a really large advance, um, you know, ahead of time. Um, and there's, there, I actually made a YouTube video about this. So if anyone wants to know the details of it, you can watch it. But that's that's one, that's the big difference a lot of the time between um, traditional and self-publishing is, is frankly the money. Yeah, yeah, possibly similar I've kind got... of... I, sorry, I was going to say very, very similar when it comes to, to fiction. Um, I think that it's one, so tradition, uh, vanity publishing or self-publishing in the past, you would pay money up front um, to somebody to publish your work and then there'd be an agreement about how the money was split up. I think that the platforms, things like Amazon have changed that a lot, but when it comes to fiction publishing on there, I think maybe they take 70% and you keep 30%, something like that. So it's maybe not the, the same kind of balance as it is with non-fiction um, publishing. Um, I've got a story about self-publishing that's a wee bit different. So um, when I was leaving St Andrews, I, I really wanted to just have something to remember my time. And I thought of, I really love these um, mid-century travel books by Stasek. They're like, you know, this is Edinburgh and whatever. And I was like, I'd love to do like a wee St Andrews homage or whatever. And I think, um, so the main difference is they didn't use Amazon or anything like that. And of, and of course, St Andrews is a niche interest. Um, it's a small town, but a lot of people come in and out of St Andrews. Um, so I think, but if you're willing to put the effort in and some money into producing a really beautiful self-published book, so things like we did a hard cover, we made sure it was lethal printed, good colour, um, I hired help for editing, and I actually had the concept in mind, but I paid um, a fellow student at the time who was winning lots of uh, slam poetry competitions to write a nice read aloud poem that could make the book. Um, and, you know, if you're if you're willing to spend the time getting a bit savvy about all these things, if you have an interest that's somewhat niche that a publisher's unlikely to go for, um, like St Andrews or I've done other ones where they're in particular communities, so I've participated in other people's smaller projects like um, uh, around a certain, around like pregnancy loss, it's aimed at a certain community, not aimed at everyone. Um, it can actually be pretty successful because we've had that book in print for about St Andrews for seven years now and it's going to its third print run. Um, and interestingly, I also illustrated a book in the US that was a USA bestseller, but I have earned more from the St Andrews book than from illustrating a US bestseller. And, and it's because of what Jen said about percentages. <laughs> so, you know, 
the St Andrews books in about three shops and I drop them off myself when I'm there or I just post them up or whatever. So there's very low overhead to that project and I suppose I had the confidence to to just dip my toe in the water because there weren't any other kind of like similar books about the town at the time. Um, yeah, but um, I think my royalty percentage for the US one is something like six or seven percent or something for a massive big five publisher. So it's really interesting, but I think the key is the quality thing because there is a lot of like stuff in the self-publishing world that has just not been um, edited or, you know, it's just not being polished and it gives the whole thing a bit of a, a reputation. Um, but the pros, the, the thing that I do love about working in traditional publishing is just that collaborative way of working, like having a team of people who all have their different um, specialisms. So one person's really focused on um, how it's going to look with the book layout and design and um, other people are thinking about pacing and page turn and like you get to have that collaborative way of working and of course you're not paying them for that they're paying you for your time um but yeah it's just it's been really interesting to see all the different ways a book can be produced now um and the, pro the progression of technology in the country in country and out of country means that you can produce like beautiful looking books and nice quality finishes in smaller quantities now so there are ways to maybe earn money by becoming the publisher yourself. I think one just final thing I just wanted to add to this conversation is that seeing pros and cons of self-publishing and traditional publishing it gets so depends on why you want to publish a book in the first place and it, it might sound like a silly thing to say because people you know you'd be like well I want to write, write a book or I want to publish a book because I want to be a writer but that's not actually necessarily always the case there's many different reasons why you might end up wanting to write a book I mean particularly when you look at non-fiction um, you know you might be the sort of person that actually what is a researcher and you want your work to have impact in policy for instance so the book is in some sense sounds a bit crass to say but is almost a marketing material um you know more so than than the actual work maybe the work that you do is done in person or is done in workshops or is done in meetings or so on and so forth and your book is more a representation of you um whereas if you're writing you know my book is very much a I wanted to write and I wanted to get my message out so it didn't as much as it's the frustrations I've had with traditional publishing I I just wanted my book out in the world I wanted my words to be there to be written so it made sense to go down that route even though there are drawbacks um and you know so I think it's all about actually trying to be really honest with yourself as to why you want a book out and also be really honest about your ego because that is a big part of book publishing and I think sometimes writers can be so like oh we're just people that like words and we want and it's like no like we have an ego you're you're writing your stuff and putting it in the world of course you've got an ego so I think we need to be reckoned with that a little bit more when we start making decisions about what we write how we write it and where we put our writing and also how we charge for it frankly. <laughs> Great. Um, still encouraging anyone that has questions to pop them in the chat and we can get them asked. Um, but we we have other questions. We'd love to hear from you guys about. Um, so can you each talk about a time in your career that was particularly challenging or a big um, difficulty or some time that you were completely thrown for a loop? And how did you uh, work to overcome that? I don't, I don't mind going first again. Um, I'll just quickly, because I mentioned it earlier, it probably was when I was made redundant. Um, I kind of touched on it um, earlier on. And as I said, the kind of, I was doing really well in my career. I was, you know, had a really good job. I was being paid well. I was getting to do really cool stuff and travel and so on and so forth. And then to kind of, I actually thought I was going into a meeting up to get a pay rise. <laughs> Oh, made redundant instead my boss uh, clearly had crossed wires in terms of uh, what she told me I was going to the meeting for but anyway and so I guess the reason I mention that is because I think particularly if you're a student at somewhere like St Andrews you're kind of used to being a high achiever you're used to doing pretty amazing things you're used to having good access and to sort of it feel suddenly like oh crap I'm not needed I'm not wanted um this big company can go on without me literally and to kind of have that thrown in your face was in some sense the hardest part of course then trying to also find a new job or well not even a new job just try and find any money to pay my London rent um, at the time so 
it massively challenged me in the sense of my own reckoning with my own kind of sense of self and and what work was to me and what I wanted to do um but it also massively I've always been relatively um resourceful but you know I, I really had to draw on my resourcefulness and kind of trying to work out how to make things work and so on and so forth but as I mentioned before it was a hundred percent the best thing that could happen to me because I wouldn't have become freelance in my early 20s otherwise I'd thought about being freelance but I thought that's something I'll do in my 30s I'm too young I don't have the contacts it's not possible and all that sort of thing um but it forced me into the position and and I haven't looked back I've been freelance now for almost seven years so um yeah that's mine I really resonate with that Gemma actually I have um had moments where divisions I've been leading have had had have had to have a big change because of some market condition changing um that really wasn't based on the performance of my team or something like that um and i yeah i know what you mean like you're you know everyone on this call is probably used to being sort of the top of their class no matter what they were at and for suddenly to either think you're going to lose your job have to lay people off on your team um can be really um hard for your sort of sense of self, especially if your sense of self is tied to your career, which I didn't realize how much mine was when moments like this have happened. But, you know, even with the, you know, for me, with the pandemic, um, a lot of our business was in schools here in the US and schools were basically closed. This is not a market condition that we could have predicted. Um, but on the other hand, you know, so there were hard things about that related to staffing. Um, and one of my motivations for working is that I love working with people. I think that sort of um, comes from my teaching background. So that is, has always been really hard for me to sort of separate my emotions about, um, you know, from the business. But on the other hand, things like that always lead to innovation um, and new opportunities and sort of letting yourself kind of glide a little bit into those things is really hard, probably for a lot of English majors. Definitely for me, I can say 100 percent is really challenging. I like to kind of know what could be coming in the next couple of years even. Um, so again, I kind of mean this, I hope, as a word of encouragement to students that are on this call. Um, it's very common if you have a corporate job to have to go through layoffs at some point in your career. Um, and you don't realize this when you're first starting, right? Like to Gemma's point, you don't really have those sort of senses that something like that could be coming. I think you do build that the longer that you're in a career, um, that instinct for like, okay, this project or this thing might not go the way that I was hoping it might go. Um, but I, in my experience, usually some innovation comes from something like that, um, you know, so I, I hope that, I hope that you feel that way too, but also don't feel like the world is ending if your job gets eliminated for some reason. I think one of the most challenging parts of freelance life is actually if something's going wrong um, and it might be nothing to do with work, um, but you don't just have the luxury of um, one boss who you can have a discreet word with and then sign off with, I don't know, sick or something for a couple of weeks. Um, there's a lot of like um, conversations and negotiating and or renegotiating a deadline and that type of stuff. And I've struggled with um, sort of like knowing how much of my like private circumstances I owe to people to, in order to explain the integrity behind my like falling behind the schedule or that type of thing and um, I found that really tricky although I found the pandemic has had a positive impact on that because everybody went through a challenging thing at the same time and suddenly everyone's like kids were on top of them and all these other things so like falling behind was just like the norm it was utter chaos in publishing I think because as well, like a lot of um, a lot of publishing places work in quite old fashioned ways. So it seemed to be quite chaotic, like switching to digital um, communication <laughs> forms. Um, and just like things like difficult conversations when you've embarked on a project and you realize it isn't working, like those type of things do come up. So I withdrew from the third of a three book contract just because I realized like I wasn't in the right direction and at the same time I'd already been sent a like a check for 50% of the advance on another book and I'd 
for, they sent a paper check for some reason and I'd like pinned it to my notice board and I was like having this um like a mentoring call and I just said you know I've got this check like on the notice board instead of in the banks like let's talk about why that is <laughs> um and just having to go back and say like I shouldn't have said yes to this because I just don't like I'm not I'm not really connecting with the the project basically um, and just challenging your assumptions about all that because I made the mistake of getting like really tied up in knots of like shame about all that and being like oh no I'm, I'm going to be like blacklisted for like messing people around or something or running late it's the worst thing that could happen and of course the main thing that becomes clear is these things happen all the time actually um, and, and especially in publishing you know because especially probably because like quite a sensitive bunch actually so I'm sure like things do happen a lot with writers and illustrators um, but the main advice is to talk to people as soon as possible <laughs> um, if you think something's not going to plan just be as, as open as you can um, and actually it sometimes works out the opposite because the same editor that I said I'm, look, I'm really sorry but this project I've said yes but actually I don't think it's for me and um, she came back six months later with a different project that was even better paid so you know I had that assumption that like this person's going to hate me for this <laughs> or they're just going to forget about me forever because it's so competitive there's no way like I've messed them around basically it's just it's bad um, but actually trying to trying to have really just like open communication as much as you can and have integrity and in how and how you keep people informed of what's going on with you is just really important um, and I would imagine that would apply to just about every like freelance project because can be more like changeable um, with a lot of different moving parts and and obviously there's no one to just jump in and cover for you um, and like you know draw a couple of pages while you have a lie down or whatever so you just have to get really good at that and and just like shaking off any sense of failure or feeling ashamed or whatever that comes when those things happen yeah <laughs> I think my biggest challenge picks up on something that both Gillian and Alison said there is the, the pandemic. Um, so within the, the first um, fortnight of the first lockdown, I saw 95% of my regular work getting cancelled. So we were in this crazy position that in the UK, everybody was sitting at home, was looking for content to read, um, but advertisers didn't want to spend money. They didn't know what to spend money on. So newspapers and magazines immediately cut their freelance budgets. It's one of the, the easiest things for them to do in a crisis. Um, and on the copywriting side of things, it was a similar kind of story. Um, companies didn't understand where people were going to be, whether we could have events, and so they they didn't spend money on very broadly sort of marketing and advertising. Um, but the skill of a freelancer in that kind of situation is then to, to go out and find work to cover that lost income. Um, as, as Gillian mentioned there, when you work for yourself, it, you've, you've got to get out and do it. You can't um, sort of rely on a colleague to help out. Um, and it's this myth that, um, you know, working for yourself, you're, you're your own boss. You're not really your own boss. You have 12 or 16 bosses instead of one boss, um, which has its pros and cons. We'll maybe come on to the pros a bit more in, in a moment. Um, but overcoming that challenge it's about getting back to basics you know if you're a journalist then the skill is coming up with the right idea for the right publication and um, but also keeping in touch with commissioning yeah, editors keeping in touch with the people who have um, commissioned work from you in the past to understand what they want um, and what their readers want and being able to fill those gaps um, because we, we um Gemma touched on this earlier on about ego, you know, as writers, there are things we want to write about, but we've got to find the balance between writing about the stuff we want to do, but actually writing about the stuff that people want to read and therefore editors want to publish. Yeah, and taking five minutes to appreciate others on a regular basis, I think really makes a difference. Because what you were saying about you're constantly nurturing lots of relationships. Um, just taking a time after, at the end of a project to send a thank you card or something or to appreciate other people in your field so if some you know you love it when someone emails you and says gosh I was really touched by what you wrote there doing the same thing to other people like I, I'm not consistent but I had tried to make a bit of a habit of just um, 
not just keeping those thoughts in my head, but expressing them to others. And it's, it's not a calculated thing necessarily, but I think it does keep, have the benefit as well of keeping you in people's minds as someone who's pleasant to work with. Um, I heard someone say there's like pleasant to work with, quality work and on time. And if you're at least two of those things, you're already ahead. Um, so, you know, and it's just, it's just nice to like, the ego thing is there certainly for all of us, otherwise we wouldn't put anything out, but um, it can alleviate the, the stress, I think, to just like get your head out of your own like bubble for a second and just send out some like good wishes to other people and just say, you know, I really like what you're doing or, or even just say, I can see what you're trying to achieve. Like if someone's written a book, like my friend's written this book about um, soil and fashion and it started off as an academic paper but it's like you know but I can see the drive behind it is to get something that makes people care about the soil <laughs> so you know just saying I see how hard you're working on this can be really valuable to people as well. I really really resonate with that Jillian um, from the corporate side also I when I started in a sort of corporate office in New York I was pretty intimidated um in many ways. And, um, I think I wouldn't have known as a student, like to do informational interviews that isn't because of anything that the career department did wrong, just cause I wasn't in that headspace. Um, and to like ask people like actual questions, like if you're curious about something, send someone a note, send someone a LinkedIn note. Can I do an informational interview with you? Can I ask you a few questions about why, why you're doing, usually people do like talking about their careers, whether they're freelance or anything else. Um, and also to Jillian's point, like just like recognizing people, if you see something that's really interesting or innovative or that you just admire, um, those human connections actually go really far. Um, and I think if you can think of it that way, instead of like networking or some word that feels sort of probably very foreign to someone that is like me, that likes writing and is an introvert, um, like sound like going to something that's called a networking event seems very intimidating to me or it did for sure in the beginning of my time in a corporate office um but these natural connections um i think are are really important and they're worth spending time on every week um it, it, in my experience um whether it's someone that works on your team or works in a different division or in a different company or just something that you notice on LinkedIn that someone is like proud of if they mention that they took the time to say like I wrote this thing, um, you know, set, letting them know that you see that is, um, yeah, I think it's good for you because it's it's important to recognize creative endeavor and I think it also can can yield sort of more transactional benefits also because people people remember you um, in this world where we have sort of ways of connecting with so many more people than ever before. Um, some humanity is, um, I think, really important. So I love that you mentioned that, Jillian. Definitely. People want to work with nice people, um, and particularly when there's so much competition out there, there are so many freelancers. Editors will work with the people who they like, the people who uh, say, say nice things to them who deliver copy on time um, so yeah a little bit of niceness goes a long way yeah definitely I do think the lesson is really when you when you are kind to yourself it does empower you I think to be kind to others as well so it's both important to take that time for your own mental health as Julian as well was talking about about saying no at the same time when you're able to actually share that positivity with a lot of other people I think that creates a really nice ripple effect in itself um, I think we have time for, or Jillian, if you'd like to say anything as well, I see you turning your uh, mic back on. I was just about to say, like, all these things about um, balance, uh, people are kind of down on the idea of, like, having a day job. <laughs> and I think from my experience, if you, want to create, if you want to do creative work, I think there is a virtue, actually, to saying this creative work is so important to me that I'm going to protect it and keep it separate. So, for example, if I really just only want to write novels, um, do I also want to do other forms of writing as my day job? I mean, maybe, but um, if I can be honest and examine, is, is, that, is that writing work actually making me not want to write anything else at the end of the day so the novel's not getting written? Um, try to really examine yourself about that because... I certainly did like 
at one point I was just just doing all picture books um but then realized like I'm not writing my own because I'm so busy doing these ones um and it's kind of all consuming so I just um I think just making sure people know that um there's more than one way to succeed <laughs> so if your aspiration is like purely creative and literary and the chances of that um, becoming the thing that pays your bills is probably maybe like 10 years away and unless you're very lucky um because even after you're published you're probably still not living off of that money until maybe a few books in uh, I heard a picture book author saying that her by the time she reached her 30th picture book it matched her teacher's salary <laughs> um so I mean there's quite a big uh, it's quite a big range in terms of pay, but I would just want to encourage people to just, you know, think, well, if that is a dream of yours, you can keep it going alongside other things um, and just be careful not to drain, to drain that dream by doing things that are kind of almost there, but not quite. Like, there's a lot to be said for not doing the second best thing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I really agree with that. We we. The business word that I have learned for that is opportunity cost, right? Like yes. when when you're saying yes to doing something, that means there's a cost to something that there there's a cost of something that you're not doing and making those priorities. I love this conversation. I think I'm like the odd one out in that I um in that I don't write for my job anymore creatively. Um, but we um I was sort of thinking about this question. It's interesting that you raised it, Jillian, before they even asked the question, because they, they have a question sort of similar to this. But um, I have had in my own mind to expand the idea of what creativity means. Honestly, I think I had a very academic idea of what being creative meant. And it actually took me working honestly with a career coach at one point to be like, using ideas in these ways is creative and that is using creative energy. Do you want creative energy to, you know, if you're creating something from, from different ideas or different teams or something that's sort of um, not actually working with content or images or language, you know, um, that's creative too. And is that how you want to be spending your time? But there's also, you know, you can't be creating with 100% of your energy. It's just, that's very exhausting. Well, I can't, I shouldn't speak for anyone else. That's very exhausting. Um, so anyway, I love this conversation because I've thought about it so much myself. And I, I think often about many of the poets um, who had jobs in insurance and were poet, ended up becoming poet laureate. Um, and then there's also many poets whose job is to be teaching poetry and writing poetry. So I love that there's so many different paths, basically. But from my own perspective, I think the only thing I can add here is that it's helped me in my own mind to kind of think about what doing a creative endeavor means um, and that there's all different ways um, to be creative and that is still satisfying in some way. And if there's a specific form of creativity to Jillian's point, that's really giving you life and energy and is something that you want to put into the world um, to really think about the opportunity cost of not doing that. Um, and also sort of balancing paying bills. I really resonated with what you said, Gemma, about living in a city too. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, oh, sorry, Gemma, if you'd like to come in here and then I, I think- I was, just, I was just gonna say, I've actually moved to Glasgow and it's not quite so bad now uh, that, that it was in London, but that was, to be honest, part, um, well, I was pregnant and wanted to be closer to home was the main reason I moved to Glasgow. But part of the reason I moved here from London was precisely this I didn't want to have to do as much day job anymore just to cover my rent if that makes sense um I wanted to be more part-time although lol any freelancer will tell you there's no such thing as being a part-time freelancer but um yeah I, I didn't want to be spending so much of my time doing work to pay the bills and I wanted more space for um creative work and also for my PhD because you know I'm paying to do a PhD I'm not being paid to do it so at the end of the day I needed I needed time so and that was literally a, a, you know, let's move out of London and go to my a better home, which is Glasgow. But, you know, because I needed to um, reduce my uh, my outgoings. Yeah, um, 
Thank you guys so much for such an amazing panel. Uh, it looks like we're at our last four minutes. Of course, my Teams is still popping off for some reason, uh, but I guess true, there's no such thing as part-time as much anymore in this kind of pandemic as well. Um, your thoughts have just been so fascinating, especially for me coming from an English background. Um, it's gonna be quite a lot of hope as well in the terms of flexibility and the path that I could take and that there's really, you know, no two roads are quite alike. Um, we'd love to hear a bit of a final thought as well, or, you know, any anything you'd love to impart to the students watching here as well um, about, you know, careers in the written word. Um, and kind of, again, I think all of you have touched on kind of both following your passions as well as navigating the business sector and the fields that you've all chosen. So if we'd like to start with Peter, I think that'd be lovely and we can work our way about uh, for some lovely final thoughts. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I, I'm conscious I've been quite down on journalism today. I've talked about problems in newsrooms. I've talked about problems in the pandemic. So I'm going to wave the flag for journalism in the last couple of minutes. Um, being a journalist has taken me to places I would never have got to go um, as a, an ordinary bod, um, sort of seeing behind the scenes at things, and um, particularly my sort of drinks writing, my wine writing has taken me to, to Georgia, to central Turkey, to California, to South Africa, to Australia. Um, and these are things I would never have been able to do off my own bat. Um, so just if anybody's thinking about journalism and they're prepared to put in the hard work, then it's a fantastic career and it will take you to some really exciting places. Yeah, thank you. If we go to uh, Alison, that'd be lovely. Well, I I don't feel like I have that much advice, but some of the things that have helped me um, navigating corporate culture are, first of all, finding mentors, um, which are people that are kind of ahead of me on the path that can answer my questions. Because as we've kind of spoken about with all of these, all of our careers, there's a lot of things that you really cannot learn until you're practicing the art or the craft or the, or the job. And so you might not even know what the words mean. So finding mentors who can kind of advocate for you also and, and help you understand what you're getting into is really important. And I know that's really hard if you are an introvert like me. Um, but that's one of the things that's been really helpful for me. And another thing is sort of understanding, we've kind of touched on this, but what motivates you in your job? Um, and maybe some of these motivations are same thing, similar things in your personal life or your creative endeavors. But for me, understanding like what makes me want to do this job, um, we didn't actually get into this, but I have sort of a miss mission cent centric part of my job that makes me feel like there's some benefit to the, I hope um, that's what I'm working toward. That's what I'm hoping to motivate my team towards some real benefit in the world. Um, and I also, as I mentioned, really like working with people and teams of people. Those are what bring me actual joy. Um, and I know that all of the folks on this call will have other things that motivate them. But really thinking about that and giving it some real effort um, will help you identify like what types of jobs you might want to take or freelance gigs you might want to take or companies that you might want to work for. Because you're, if, you, if there's no alignment there with what you actually like doing, and in most cases, it's not making money. In some cases, some people do really enjoy just the act of making money. But in many other cases, your motivation is something deeper than that. So kind of trying to think through what that is um, will help you find a, a fit that really feels more natural. And it feels like your job kind of makes sense with your overall life, you know. Yeah, that's, that's quite beautiful. I definitely, it's nice to know that there's a lot of passion in that as well. Um, we go to Jillian and then we'll end with Gemma. So Jillian, uh, any final thoughts on this? Um, it's probably something I've heard to my agent say, but um, we're not in brain surgery. So like, take the pressure off yourself, basically. It really isn't life or death, although there is influence in, in writing and the narratives that we contribute to putting out in the world. It's also, it's not brain surgery, like, just do it, just do things, just try stuff. Um, no need to, like, overthink it and tie yourself up, up in a knot about it. Just experiment, you know. We, I think the key thing that I have learned is the more that I can keep in a spirit of, like, playfulness, the better the work ends up being. Um, 
something that was actually helped in the pandemic because my kids were around 24 7 and like causing mayhem and like instead of going against the tide of what they're doing I just like kind of joined in with the play and it resulted in a lot of interesting like stuff in terms of children's books um I see over time a lot of people get tied up in knots about like what form of publishing they're from and did they make the short list for this thing and like is my does this branch of Waterstones like even have my book and like all that stuff um which is all very enjoyable but it's also not you know I've spent a lot of time drawing um scenes where the person is increasingly smaller just to remind myself that it's really a big universe out there this this thing that you're working on is important yes but it's also um nothing's no one's gonna die if it doesn't you know hit the hit the top 10 list or whatever like it's all it's all good and there's also no um I mean gatekeeping is talked about and certainly exists in its forms in the publishing world but on the other hand we we also exist in one of the most democratic times in history for writers because you can just write what you want and put it on the internet and people can read it and that is quite a special time to be alive I think because there's so much freedom and saying, you know, actually, I can just start a newsletter or a blog, or I can, and you know, or I can make a, a Kindle download or whatever I want to do. Um, so you know, starting to see that the barriers to entry in terms of you have something to say and you want other people to hear it are actually quite low. And and if you have the courage to engage in that process and it and just let it be a bit messy, like lots of good. good real world opportunities can come from that, which is certainly something I've experienced. Um, I'll, I'll keep it quite short because I appreciate we're, we're um, probably gone over, but thanks everyone for, for staying. Um, just to kind of bring it back to the, you know, this is a panel about writing. Um, something that I've <laughs> learned is that the only way something gets written is if you sit down and write. And I know that sounds so stupid, but honestly, um, you can feel like crap and you can feel like your stuff is rubbish. You can, the last thing you want to do is write and all that sort of thing. It, unfortunately, that doesn't always go away. And the only way to get the words out is to sit in front of a laptop and write it. And one of the things I've also learned is that just because you might be finding writing hard doesn't mean that you're not meant to be a writer. It doesn't mean that you're, that it's not for you. Because um, I spend a lot of time hating writing. I spend a lot of time struggling. I know that sounds so pitiful. Why on earth would you put yourself through it? But um, ultimately, I, I feel the need to do it. And I've spent a lot of time questioning whether I should, whether this is meant for me, because I find it hard. And it's wasted time, um, you know? So... I guess, yeah, just sort of finish it. It's no matter what kind of writing you want to do, whether it's fiction, whether it's journalism, whether it's personal writing, whatever, um, you just have to do it and not worry about whether you're going to get paid for it, whether or not it's going to get published. The only way to get better is to just do it and the only way for it to stop feeling so crap is for you to get on with it and then it's done. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just wanted to finish with that. Writing can be so amazing, but you have to do it in order for it to feel amazing. Well, sounds like quite good advice, but Especially now that I'm finishing up my coursework for the year. Uh, so maybe I'll get back on that as well. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to be here and especially thank you to Megan and Eddie and Zoe for helping organize this amazing event, put all this together. Um, I'll hand it over to Megan for some final remarks and some plugs for the Cruise Center and um, yeah, thank you so much again. Thank you, Catherine, as well. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you all so much. So fabulous. Um, we have, Zoe has put up um, contact information. We have uh, stuff for our, the Career Center and for um, our development folks. Um, Zoe, can you go back to the uh, contact info for our folks? There it is. Okay. Um, so please do reach out. Um, they have willingly given out the, the best contact information for them. So if you are interested in continuing conversations, have specific questions um, that you didn't feel that you wanted to ask for the whole group, that's perfectly fine. Um, they are more than happy to help you do that. Um, we, we plugged a little bit for Saint Connect, which is another way um, that, that you are able to connect with other alums from, um, from St. Andrews. So please use that tool as well. If you haven't signed up for that, please do so. It's a great way to connect with our community. Um, and if you 
enjoyed this are interested in perhaps contributing to um, these kind of narrative um, experiences, we would love to have you participate. So reach out to Eddie or myself or anyone um, and we can get you connected. And we love our alums when they come and share their stories. They're always so interesting and so varied and so much fun to hear their expertise. So please do reach out. We'd love to we'd love to have you. Um, but yeah, thanks for um, for everyone for joining. Thanks for our to our presenters and then yeah, enjoy the last of your alumni weekend festivities. Yeah, thank you guys. Take care. Don't Thanks. get attacked by seagulls. <laughs> Cheers, everyone.